Thank you for the introduction. Hi, I'm Min Ki Han from Korea, KIAS, Korean Institute of Advanced Study. Uh, first of all, I want to say that it is really honored to invite this conference for giving a talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for everyone. Okay, today I will talk about the, my recent work about the quantum cryptography, which is inspired by a purely physics paper. This is a joint work with Tomoyuki Morimae from Kyoto University and Takashi Yamakao from NTT in Kyoto. Okay, let me briefly summarize the, our main contribution just in just a few minutes. Uh, in this work, we'll revisit the recent work of Aronson, Atia, Suskind, who are probably physicists. Uh, and their main motivation was from the quantum gravity, which I am not well understood. So basically their main motivation is showing some quantum physics stuff or quantum gravity stuff. However, we found that their idea can be used to the computer science and cryptography. So we find, we extend their result and find some more interesting property and show that it can be really have many applications in quantum cryptography. And actually it was already appeared in many previous work, like a quantum gold living theorem. Beside that, we show that there are many applications of this idea. The first one is the new public key, public key encryption construction based on the non-abelian group action. And the other one is the, to showing that the two notion of uh, quantum bit commitment are essentially the same. In the classical setting, they are in principle same or equivalent, but the connection between them are somewhat ambiguous. And the second part, uh, second application has some concurrent work by Kun, yeah, anyway, <laughs> okay. Let me start from the, uh, the first part, the quantum source to decision reduction or the main idea of the technique. First of all, Soskin cared about the following macroscopic quantum state, the world with black core and the world without black core. This is very strange to me. But anyway, he concerns about this state and conjecture that, oh, even if we are living in the proportion of a world with black core and without black core, probably to us, it is hard to detect we are in the, this quantum state or not, because he conjectured that this distinguishing is somewhat equivalent to the mapping the world with black core to the world without black hole, which is apparently impossible. Actually, I don't know why he concerned about this quantum state, but yeah, anyway, this, this was the main motivation of their lizard. So I just want to introduce this. Yeah, beside the very dress for black hole, we can, talk, we can work with some more friendly cats. Let's think about the Schrodinger's cat experiment. As we all know, in this experiment, we prepare a hypothetical cat in the cat state and measuring uh, some quantum atom. And if we decay, we kill it. Otherwise, do nothing. So as a result of the experiment, we have a mixture of uh, two cat, a live cat and dead cat. So recall that this Schrodinger's experiment was uh, proposed to criticize the quantum physics itself. So if we, if we are willing to follow the original motivation, then our goal of this experiment is to distinguish the following two states. Uh, the state with quantum cat, I mean, a live cat plus dead cat, and another word with classical cat, a uh, cat is alive with probably half and dead with probably half. Okay, in principle, okay, by distinguishing these two words, we can, okay, we can determine if our world is quantum or classical, right? But uh, according to quantum physics, in principle, we can determine these two states with some high probability, but 
since we are living in the finite time world, we need to determine where are we in some bounded time or efficiently de determine it. So here we need some computational assumption or computational bounded assumption for the adversary. So uh, following the classification of Henley, we are talking about the computational quantum cryptography thing. Okay. This computational bounded or efficient is very important in this talk. Okay, let's simplify the task of this distinguishing task. Uh, since uh, by the convexity argument, the classical mixture of a uh, live cat and dead cat is uh, in the middle of uh, these two state, a live plus dead, a live plus dead, and a live minus dead. This is a simple calculation. So we are basically want to distinguishing these two state or want to determine if the proposition or inter interference is plus or minus. So we are focusing on this task to distinguish the alive plus dead and alive minus dead. Of course, I'm always ignoring the normalizing factor. Okay, then I can introduce the theorem of Arons Natisa Skint. They show that our primary task of distinguishing alive plus dead, alive minus dead. Okay, let's simply say that plus and minus. Distinction plus and minus state is equivalent to the other state, which is mapping the alive cat to dead and dead cat to alive using a single unitary. Here, I mean equivalent, uh, I mean equivalent by uh, if we can solve uh, one task in computation in time t, then we can solve the other task within time t plus something small. So in other words, if we are, one of the problem is hard to solve, then the other one is also hard to solve. Okay. Our original goal is to distinguish the plus and minus state or detecting the interference between alive and dead. And the other task, the new task of Arons Natiasos Kint is swapping alive and dead, right? It, it is a very simple theorem, but based on this observation, Arons argued that somewhat very strange thing. Uh, if we are considering the second task, and if we are given a uh, dead cat, can we move to the alive cat? It is apparently impossible task, at least in the computational setting. So, yeah, yeah. According to this theorem, Aronson argued that, oh, probably it is really hard to detecting this <laughs> interference between alive plus dead and alive minus dead, because if we can do, then we can resurrect the dead cat to alive. Yeah, so <laughs> according to Aronson's word, this uh, detecting the proposition of uh, alive and dead is necromancy had problem. And this is exactly what Aronson's word. Okay, this is very interesting theorem. And uh, let, me form, uh, let me describe the former statement of the theorem. Actually, they show something stronger. Uh, apparently, alive and dead cat are orthogonal, so we assume that we are given two orthogonal state x and y, and define plus and minus state as psi and pi. Psi is x plus y, and pi is x, mi x minus y. Then, for any constant, positive constant delta, the following two tests are computationally equivalent, which means that uh, the circuit complexity of the following two tests is almost the same. The first one is the, uh, some unitary that maps x to y and y to x. If delta is equal to one, this is exactly mapping x to y and y to x, but we allow some imperfect swapping. And the second task is to distinguishing psi and pi, or detecting the interference between x plus y and x minus y. Yeah, this is the main theorem, and they show that this theorem is almost optimal. And we slightly extend this theorem, like uh, we can consider the Ancilla state, but uh, let me describe it later. 
Actually, the proof of this theorem is so also very simple. It can be summarized in this slide. Just looking at this slide and computing something, then you can show the this theorem. This theorem. And as you can see, these two circuits are very focal circuits. So it is very obvious that some previous papers use something similar technique to this. Okay. Oh, here we can set delta to the negligibly small, so we can use it for the cryptography, which was the main idea of our lizard. So let's replace, paraphrase Aron's Natiasos equivalence theorem or AAS theorem to in the computational theory or computational science or cryptographic in context. Okay. They show that the task of swapping X and Y and distinguishing Psi and Pi is computationally equivalent, right? And in the first task, in some sense, we are given X as an instance and we are asked to find Y or vice versa. So the first task is a kind of search problem. And the second task is the decision problem, very apparently. So in some sense, we can think it as a search to decision reduction or a connection between search problem and decision problem. Of course, it is not preserved the problem structure, but anyway, the connection between search and decision problem is very important in computational science and cryptography. For, for example, when we considering the satisfiability problem, we usually define it as a decision problem, but we usually want to find the solution of circuits. So it, when we are talking about finding solution, at some point we need to connect the search problem to decision problem, right? And when we are talking about cryptography, we usually assume search problem is hard, like uh, factori factorization is hard, discrete logarithm is hard, one-a function, inverting one-a function is hard. They are all search, search problem, but at the end, we usually want to show some distinguishing hard. For example, encryption of zero and encryption of one are hard to distinguish. This is a decision problem. So at some point, we again need some connection between search and decision problem. So we can interpret AAS equivalence theorem as a new quantum search to decision reduction or connection between search and decision problem. I believe this is our main message. Yeah, the theorem of Arons Natias Waskint is a new connection between search and decision problem, only holding the quantum setting and classically we do not know any analog. Yeah, and as it is simple, there are some implicit, <laughs> there are some work that use the implicitly the same idea like a quantum goldley levin theorem and recently interestingly many similar ideas appear concurrently but anyway beside of them we again found the, yeah, i said that in the introduction so yeah let's talk about the power of uh, this technique in the cryptography quantum goldley levin theorem is not our contribution but since it is simple i include it it for covering my 40 minutes. Okay, uh, Gordiri Rebin's theorem uh, usually discussed about the starting from the 1A permutation, can you construct some hard to decision problem? This is the question of Gordiri Rebin. 1A permutation is a efficiently computable permutation from end to end. So given x, we can compute px very easily, but only given px, it is really hard to find x on, the, on average. And main question is, can we find some hard to decision problem based on this? This is the, just a search problem. And Goldray Levin's answer is, uh, this problem is hard. Given px and random r, it is hard to find the inner product of r and x. 
but the classical proof of Gaudry Levin is very complicated and somewhat hard to follow. It, it takes at least one lecture. But in the quantum setting, at Cook and Clapp suggest uh, there is a much more simpler proof. And you can interpret their proof as uh, an application of equivalent theorem. So let me describe it. Okay. okay uh, one way permutation means that we are hard to invert Px. So we are really hard to change Px0 and Pxx, right? We just augment to our single bit. So based on the hardness of inversion, we are know that swapping Px00 and Px1x is hard. Because if we can do that, we can invert the permutation. Then AAS equivalent theorem suggests that oh, since they are hard to swap, we can hard to uh, it is hard to distinguish in these two quantum states, px tensor 0, 0 plus 1x and 0, 0 minus 1x. Then we have uh, some hard to distinguish problem, but it is quantum. So we measure the second register in the Hadamard basis. Then after some com computation, we have the following measurement result. If the sign was plus, then the resulting state is, has the inner product of R and X in the second register. And if the sign was minus, then the, it has the R product X plus one in the second register. So basically, they are the only difference part. So, but they are hard to distinguish, right? So it is hard to distinguish in Rx and Rx plus one, which means that we cannot compute the inner product of R and X given R and Px. This is the quantum Gordry Levin theorem. And based on the AAS theorem, you can show that easily. Yeah, actually it is not our lizard and we do not include it in our paper, but yeah, anyway. Yeah, so besides this simple application, we, are we want to talk about our main lizard. All of them are based on the equivalence of swapping X and Y and distinguishing X plus Y, X minus Y. Based on this equivalence, we construct the quantum ciphertext public key encryption from non abelian curve action, which uh, previously only mini crypt constructions like a one-way function symmetric key encryptions are known based on non abelian curve action. And we show that, uh, a second, we show that two different no notion of quantum bit commitment are almost the same. Previously, there are somewhat complex conversion between them. Okay, let's talk about the group action thing. To do so, I need to introduce group action, of course. <laughs> the group action over all group G and set S is defined by a map from G times S to S, which is very well compatible with group operations. For example, if the, we, we choose the group element as an identity, then this maps set element to the same one. And it well, well compatible with the group operations as described in there. And since we are working on cryptography, we need to assume something in this group action is hard. The first one is the wanderingness of group action which means that even we are given uh, input and output of a group action, S and GS, it's really hard to find G itself, which means that we, it is hard to find which group action was applied, applied. And should random group action means that if we are choose a random group action, then the result looks like random to group elements. Okay, this is the basic assumption of a cryptographic group action. And we are especially talking about non-abelian group action. This was suggested by recently as a new cryptographic assumption. But uh, on the other hand, 
Abelian group action is very, somewhat very studied in less than post-quantum cryptography. This is because in the Abelian group action, we can use the diff hellman style key exchange, like uh, Alice generator, some random group element G and GS, pop generate a uh, random group element H and compute the HS, then they share GS and HS. Then given this share, they together compute GHS in the following way, only given the, the, their public inf information and their secret information. But in this protocol, the commutativity is very important since we need to change the order of G and H. But in, when we are talking about non-abelian group action, we cannot change the order of G and H. So because of it, uh, until listen, uh, until our work, there is no construction of a public encryption based on the non-abelian group action. And we did it. So <laughs> in a diagram, this is something like a status before our work and we do that direction based on the cryptographic non abelian group action we construct public encryption. <laughs> yeah, the basic idea is to encode the bit in the face to use the AAS equivalent theorem, which means uh, we, the basic intuition is something like that. Given a random set element S and the group action lizard GS, we want to construct the ciphertext of the following form, 0s plus minus 1gs. And oh uh, yeah, if it is encryption of 0, then the sign is plus, then and encryption of 1, then it is, the sign is minus. Okay, then if we, we construct this ciphertext, then AAS theorem suggests that distinguishing these two plus and minus state is equivalent to swapping 0s and 1gs. But it intuitively says that it has an ability to map s to gs, or probably we need to know g is there, which means that we need to break the one wingness of a cryptographic group action. But there are many problems of this construction because we do not know how to construct this kind of ciphertext. And the, that below intuition is somewhat problematic. <laughs> yeah, we need to do some many work, many more work to prove the security. And our actual con construction is much more complicated, but oh, I don't want to describe the full detail, but it is efficiently constructable given some information. And we can show that this is indeed secure. Uh, more pre precisely, if the underlying group action is should random, then it is in CPA secure. And if the underlying group action is one way, then it is in CPA secure, or we can construct some hard cryptographic primitive, which is, we do not know, yeah, yeah it's, yeah, <laughs> okay. Anyway, assuming the pseudo randomness, we can construct the in CPA public key encryption. But as you can see, the ciphertext is quantum. So it actually, we in our paper, we claim that we solved the open problem posed by 2019, but it is somewhat cheating because they basically want to construct classical public encryption, but we construct quantum public encryption. It's so much thing, but anyway, we did something. Okay, then I want to move to the quantum bit commitment. Okay, I'm really thanked to Hilly because he described something about commitment thing. In the Commitment scheme, there are two parties called sender and receiver. And for simplicity, we are only considering the non interactive case, which proceeds as follows. In the first phase, committing phase, Alice send the commitment C to Bob, Alice and Bob, yeah. 
And in the opening phase, Ellis send the opening O to Bob. Oh, oh. Okay, initially, Ellis need to choose his own bit. And at the end, Bob need to convince that, oh, Ellis actually choose that bit. So, yeah, this is the two-phase protocol. And since there are two parties, we need to consider two security notion. One is the hiding property and the other is binding property. In the hiding property, the receiver cannot know which bit is committed before opening phase. And for the binding property, but, uh, no, sender cannot change his mind after committing, but before the opening phase, yeah. And actually, in principle, we need, uh, we want both of the security holes statistically or forever hold, but this is known to be impossible even in the quantum setting. So in cryptography, we usually consider two different notion of commitment. The first one is statistical hiding, hiding computational binding, and the other one is computational binding statistical hiding. Did I say the same? Okay, anyway, there are two different notion of a commitment scheme. And okay, let's talk about the quantum bit commitment scheme. Oh, yeah. Quantum bit commitment scheme has some advantages over the classical one because it has some simpler construction and it is known that it is inherently non interactive. And there are some called the uh, canonical quantum bit commitment proceed as follows. Uh, in the initial phase, sender constructs some quantum state pi b based on his choice b. Then, which is over the two register C and R. And in the commitment, commitment phase, send the, just send the register C without do anything. And in the opening phase, it send the register R. This is very simple construction. I mean, simple syntax. And Recently, based on this syntax, uh, Jan shows that there is some efficient conversion between two flavor, two security notion of uh, commitment, statistical hiding and statistical binding. But it is still somewhat complicated, like uh, it needs a polynomial number of a core of a base scheme. But in our paper, we show that they are essentially the same, which means that we can construct the one by calling the other one only single query. Is it make sense? Okay, anyway. To proceed before proceeding to the proof, let me observe something about the equivalence theorem. As you can see in the proof, uh, if the algorithm A do not act on some qubits then the resulting algorithm you also do not have the same qubit. And the vice versa holds. So in some sense, it is, we can say that this equivalence theorem is locally preserving. So if A acts on, for example, if A only acts on the first few qubits, then the resulting U also acts on the first few qubits. This is the locality preserving property. And we extend this result to the advice setting, which means that the theorem holds even if the algorithm make use of some ancillary state. This is only because for in the commitment setting, we are usually considering the non-uniform security. Okay, based on this observation, let's describe our conversion thing. To do so, we need to interpret the hiding and binding in the context of uh, equivalence theorem. Okay, both of them are only considering the situation right before the opening. And in that case, 
sender have a register on R and receiver have a register C. So the quantum state is divided into two different registers. And hiding property says that the, okay, let's say that the commitment is pi zero and pi one. Uh, hiding property says that pi zero and pi one are hard to distinguish by the receiver side, which means that they are hard to distinguish by applying uh, some unitary over C. Since receiver only have a register C. On the other hand, binding says that the sender cannot change his mind, which means that the sender cannot change the pi zero to pi one by only applying some unitary over register R. You can see that they are somewhat dual, right? Binding properties some swapping problem and hiding properties some decision problem and they apply some some operation on two different registers so our basic idea is as follows for given pi zero and pi one we define psi b as a superposition of pi zero and pi one with plus and minus then the equivalence theorem says that if the original protocol has the binding property, which means that swapping pi zero and pi one by unitary over R is hard, then the equivalence theorem says that distinguishing psi zero and psi one by applying a unitary over R is hard, which is seems like a hiding. But the register of the law of register C and R is changed. We can apply the similar thing to the hiding property, which result in a kind of binding property over the register C. So we in principle, <laughs> based on this observation, we can construct the commitment using this side. But the, some simple problem some basic problem is probably psi zero and psi one may be not orthogonal. So in the actual construction, we just augment a single bit zero and one for psi zero and psi one to make them orthogonal. Then uh, by appropriating, appropriately giving the name of a common mountain register, <laughs> level register, we can construct the new commitment scheme, which has a different hiding and binding property. I mean, yeah, this, this statement word, which changed the security notion of a commitment scheme. If the original scheme is computational hiding, then the new scheme is computational binding, and, and so on, yeah. The, almost the same construction was presented by Gunju Ma Chandri recently. Yeah. Okay. I think this is the conclusion. We present a new connection between search problem and decision problem based on the some physics equivalence theorem by Ernst Natya Soskint. And we found some interesting application of this equivalence theorem in the quantum cryptography. Yeah, I have some open questions. The first one is though, can you find some further generalization or improvements? For example, in my theorem, I assume that two given state X and Y are orthogonal, but there are some variant that X and Y maybe cannot be non orthogonal but they are somewhat different and many things are somewhat different from our paper and there are also some multiple state version in uh, which has uh, application to the collapsing thing but i'm not sure they are the end of story maybe there are some other generalization generalization of this equivalence theorem and maybe we can improve some parameters and yeah 
I also really want to find further application of this theorem, for example, in the complexity theory. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, do you have any good examples of uh, uh, candidate non-abelian group actions that are believed to be hard? Oh, you mean for the cryptographic group action, non-abelian group action? Yeah. Uh, I cannot remember, but the original paper of uh, 2019 have some, I think at least they have at least two or three candidate construction. Some, I cannot remember the name, which is uh, very complex. Some tensor product thing. I, yeah, there are some candidate construction for non-abelian group action. But the problem is they are very inefficient, as I understood. See, um, so, um, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just have a very basic simple question. So in the beginning of your talk, you mentioned, uh, um, you talked about like, uh, in the original work by Susking, they have like, um, trying to relate interference to um, trying to relate interference uh, to this, this one? no the next slide oh yeah the previous slide yeah yeah the interference and uh, like converting one to the other so how does the interference related to distinguish uh yeah distinguish them like somehow there's a jump like of like concepts here Actually, one problem is I'm not sure I am correctly understand the, what the meaning of interference here. <laughs> I just in, interpret it as a, a interference probably say that it is a sign of plus and minus. Yeah, but yeah, I think basic question is to distinguishing the word of a proposition and the classical mixture of them. So, but but the mathematical result is rigorous, right? That's also in the same paper, right? In, the, uh, you mean the Suskind? Yeah. I think, I have no idea why he thought about it, but it was resolved by the Arons Natya Suskind using the, this connection. Okay, so there are different papers. Yeah, yes, yes. Okay, I see, thank you. I have another question here. Oh, yeah. Hi. <laughs> Very cool techniques. Uh, just to make sure I didn't miss anything. So in this um, quantum, simple quantum proof that you showed for the Goldreich Levin hardcore yeah. bit uh, theorem. Yeah. Um, right. I mean, for this proof to work, you need to assume that the one wayness holds against quantum uh, algorithms, right? Oh, yes, yes. Right. It doesn't work uh, if, if you just assume one wayness against classical yes, algorithms. Yes, yes, of course. Too bad. I mean, that would have been very cool uh, to have such <laughs> yeah. a simple quantum proof for a classical result. But okay, there's this catch. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry, so also on this topic, if I understand correctly, you said you didn't write this argument up in your paper. Is there any way I could see this argument in more detail? Oh, you mean the quantum coordinate? Yeah, yeah, thing? exactly. Uh, actually, uh, I just briefly skimmed the paper of uh, Ed Koch and Clapp, and uh -huh. I guess that, oh, probably it is the application of AES, and I didn't check the full detail. <laughs> yeah. They do not mention, I mean, they have some circuit for proving the proof. Yeah. And their circuit is very similar to the combination of these two. So I thought that, oh, probably it is a, this equivalent theorem. So I just interpreted it and write my own proof. Ah. 
Yeah. Because, uh, sorry, I, I think I was actually not able to 100% follow it during the talk itself. So if I want to see this argument again, can I uh, look it up somewhere? Uh, I, I'm sorry. As in, I, I did not 100% follow the argument during the talk. So yeah. if I want to see it again, can I find it somewhere? Maybe not. Okay. <laughs> 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 Uh, if you want, I can share the slide, but yeah. Uh, hi, Minke. Thanks for the talk. Yeah, I just have a question about the like quantum advice case. Like you said, the theorem holds for the quantum advice case, and you just got a worse bond. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering, like, is this because that in the advice, even there are like ancillary bits, like is it because the input state is, is grows up, like input space it grows up, or like is there any other reasons? Like, uh, and what's the bound you, like how worse is the bound? Like you got? Oh, oh I, I'm sorry, you, you, what, can you repeat the question? Oh yeah, sorry, uh, I'm just wondering about the like, uh, quant the advice case, like when they're like, uh, a, a silly abyss, yeah. like as input, like and you said the theorem still holds, but the bound gets worse. Oh yes. Yeah, so I'm just wondering why, why like how worse it gets is because is it because like when they are like ancillary bits so the input space is like grows larger or oh actually the proof is somewhat different to this uh, we want to invoke this theorem but uh for example if you want to this oh i cannot remember correctly but one direction is very obviously follow the original theorem but for the other direction we want to apply this theorem, so we need to recover the advice. I mean, yeah, advice may be, well, ancillary state may be broken by applying the, some operation, and we just apply some artificial thing to recover the ancilla, which makes some worse bound. Uh, I, I think, thanks. Thank you for the question. I, um, the equivalence you have for uh, the bit commitment, the two flavor of bit commitments, mm -hmm. uh, does it hold also for interactive commitments or? Uh, for the interactive case, you mean, you mean the equivalent thing? Yeah, for uh, the statistical hiding and. Yeah, I, I, I think they should hold because the result of uh, Yan 2022 shows that every interactive quantum bit commitment can be collapsed to the non-interactive one. Oh. So yeah, so we just focus on the non-interactive one. In oh, this okay. Time. Yeah, thank you. 